Good morning. Welcome to our Declare War series. Now, somebody may ask, you know, why are we talking about warfare? We're Canadians, we're pacifists, yada, 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 right? Well, actually, we're talking about, yeah, not very well. <laughs> um, the, the reason we're going to declare war this series is we're going to declare war uh, because we're actually already in one, right? We're all, always, there's things in life, major things that we contend with. And, and a lot of people get overwhelmed by these things. Uh, the first one is evil, right? Evil can become an overwhelming force in our world. You know, we look at the, the different um, things of history or that are going on in the world right now, the um, people who are oppressed or people who are starving or people who are medically suffering. And, and actually, you know, the last 20 years have been actually a lot of good news in our world. But sometimes we still look at the, the damage that is done human beings due to human beings in this world, and we go, that's just overwhelming. How will we over, ever overcome that? The second one is culture. Culture is something we're all in, but at times, culture can drive us to self-destructive behavior. Right? It was, um, I, I often use this analogy, but um, have you ever watched a commercial on TV about life insurance? Or you know about uh, you know health insurance or about uh, obviously stateside, but different types of insurance, and they're always used. The motivating factor in them is fear, and so they try to scare you. They say if you don't buy our insurance, this will happen to your family, or if you don't buy insurance, this might happen to you, and we're driven by fear and guilt into purchasing insurance that we may actually not actually need. And so there's all kinds of things in our culture that drive it. You don't wear this dress, then you're not, you know, in fashion. You know, guys, if you don't own this truck, then you're not, you know, a real man. Things like that. And that may be true, but we don't like people pointing it out, right? <laughs> um, the third one is the one I want to focus in on. And this may seem funny to you, but I want you to bear with me in the next few weeks. And that is the um, war that we need... To declare on the version of ourselves that is going to or can destroy us and you may say what, what do you mean we're declaring war on ourselves there there is a version of you that at times we let rule us that can lead us into all kinds of damaging behavior things that we can do to our we're actually not really good with ourselves in a lot of ways and so what we want to offer today is an alternative way of thinking so that you can be the you that God wants you to be and that you would more appreciate yourself being. Someone who makes a difference in the world, someone who, who has an impact, someone who has deep, meaningful relationships, someone who's looked at as someone um, with integrity and dependability. You know, we all really would like to be those people. If you think of people you admire, there's people you admire that are rich and all that, and you kind of, wow, I wish I could have that. But then there's people in your life you admire because you know in the middle of the night you could pick up the phone and they would be there. Or you know, you know, or you can remember a time you went through an incredibly dark season and they showed up. Or there was a time where you thought something could not possibly happen, and then you saw that person work through and accomplish something amazing. Something You go, I, I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have dealt with that horrible sickness, or I couldn't have gone through that divorce, or I couldn't have lost that child and, and, and be you know, still alive today, or still coherent, or even have my faith. And some people come through and they do that. So we want to declare war on the version of ourselves that is weak, that gives up, that is negative, and that is self-destructive. And so that's what we're going to be talking about in this series. And the first, today, we're going to talk about the um, idea of overcoming or changing how we think. Okay? And next week, we talk about what we say. This is going to be a great series for uh, a renovation of your heart that is going to clean house and also empower you to be the person that you need to be. All right? Um, an example of that is that when I talk about self-destructive behavior with people, um, I don't know if you ever heard of the art, artist Banksy. Banksy did this painting, which was Girl with Balloon, and it was up in an auction house, and they auctioned it off for $1.4 million. Right after the auction closed, 
Banksy had put a shredder in the bottom of the painting, and as all the elite looked on, the shredder activated and the painting went down and was ripped to pieces. $1.4 million. Now, a couple questions. Did they make the person honor the $1.4 million bid after they destroyed the painting? But more interesting is they had more security around this because nobody wanted it to get stolen. There was all kinds of outward security, but the problem, the real problem, was in the painting, that they had this shredder attached to it. This is uh, the story of humanity. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody, and it looks like they got all kinds of things going, and things are going great, and all those, and then they do something self-destructive that undermines everything they're about. So, sometimes you'll see people in life that are really healthy, but they always complain about how they feel. Or you see people who go through genuine times of depression, anxiety, and these are real things. Like mental health is a huge issue in our world. And, and they feel overwhelmed with it. But they end up doing things that actually make the illness worse rather than embracing the things that might help them become a little better. This is the story of humanity. We can be very destructive on ourselves. Um, in medicine, there's statistics in medicine as far as um, prescribed medicines is shocking. Um, when a doctor prescribes a medication, one-third of people will not even fill the prescription. Of the remaining 67%, half the people will either not use it, use it improperly, or lose it. The remaining third are the type of people who actually use the medication properly. A third of people. And here's the interesting thing about it. This is, is actually true even of organ people who get organ transplants and then have to take medication so they don't reject the organ. They, the statistics are the same for people like that. Can you imagine getting a new heart and not taking the medication that's going to help you get better? Do you know there is one type of prescription that almost always gets filled, always is dispersed properly, always is um, conducted with a certain amount of detail and a certain amount of thought? You know what it is? Veterinary prescriptions. You know, we're really good at taking care of our dogs, but we're far less better at taking care of ourselves. What come with some of the battles? I mean, I've listed a couple, but anxiety or depression, moodiness. You know, maybe maybe you're you're one of these people, and and you're you're always angry. You know, you're angry at people around you, and you're angry at your family for not being this, or you're angry at your spouse for not being this, or you're angry at your at your kids for not being this, and and you're angry at life and this career you wanted, but you didn't get that career. You got something else, and you just feel like your whole life's Plan B. And it's created this moodiness in you, this anger, where everybody around you isn't good enough. Do you really want to live that way your whole life? Is that really how you want to live? Or maybe your moodiness is, is connected with victimhood. Maybe somebody legitimately really hurt you one time. Or several times. And you've carried this around in your life since then. And it's horrible. You can't sit down with a person who's going to listen to your story without bawling their eyes out. Because it's horrible to hear the capacity of people to hurt other people. But here's the thing. Is it possible? Is there a road that is going to help you overcome that abuse? Is it possible that you could live a victorious, brave, free life? Is that possible? Suicidal thoughts, another big one. Just people that struggle with thinking of taking their own life because they're, they feel so helpless. Overeating. You know, we live in a culture where we are eating ourselves to death, quite literally. Uh, other numbing agents that we may be in, involved with. These are the distractions. You know, I, I, I got my credit card bill. It's really dire and everything like that, so I'm going to feel better, so I'm going to go shopping. Right? Um, you know, or if I, you know, um, I... I want the thrill of gambling you know so i'll go and i'll play cards or whatever even though i can't afford to do it 
these kind of things. Social media, you know, portraying an image of ourselves that we put out there, or watching our friends and believing that world is real. When in reality, some of it might be real, but a lot of it isn't. You know, if I take a picture of myself, and I haven't got much to work with, and I take a picture of myself and put it online, you know, I might spruce it up a little bit and, you know, the angle and maybe take five or ten and make sure I get the right one, you know. i never forget, I was at the CNE when I was a teenager. I was walking through and this guy was, um, he was doing portraits of people. He said, do you want a self-portrait? And I said, mister, if you had a mug like mine, would you want a self-portrait? He didn't say anything, right? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, there's all these kinds of things, distractions things that we let take us off the road of productivity or meaning or relationship into just time wasters. Things we do that really lend no value to our lives. But they are the battles we fight. So, we're going to talk about a battle, and I'm going to be using the analogy of a wolf for a couple of reasons. One, we're Canada, in Canada and we like wolves. I don't know if you ever read Farley Mowat's book on wolves in northern, I, I can't remember what it was called, but it was amazing. Yeah, cry wolf, yeah. Never cry wolf, that's right. It was brilliant, you know, and he talked, he just studied these creatures for a while, and, and uh, just amazing story. But wolves are actually fascinating creatures. They're incredibly loyal. They are willing to put themselves in harm's way for the value of the pack. They uh, network. In fact, wolves will actually coordinate their pregnancies inside a pack so that if there's one wolf that has a new litter, one of the other wolves can nurse that litter if that mother's ever taken out. They're amazing creatures. They're just remarkable what they do and how supportive they are. So we're going to be looking at wolves a little bit. And you may say, you know, I, I don't know if I want to be a wolf. You know, just substitute turtle or something in there. But just make sure you have the traits right, okay? So... How do we overcome the way we think? Because how we think can make a huge difference. Have you ever heard of the, probably you've heard the name Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was the President of the United States in the early part of the last century. He was kind of an interesting guy. Um, he was one of these guys that everything he did, he did 100%. Okay? So he, his life, like he's the only president of the United States who's ever won the Congregational Medal of Honor. And he won it at kind of a turning point in his life. He was in the Spanish-American War. He was in Cuba. And uh, he was supposed to lead some troops into this battle. And barring his way before he could charge was this horrible barbed wire fence. Barbed wire is a horrible invention. Um, just, just horrible because it... It not only prevents you from going places, it damages you as you go through and stuff. And he's, he's lying down and he's about to go under this barbed wire and lead his troops in. And he was terrified. But he said, all of a sudden, my inner wolf came through. And I never looked back. And he ended up leading a charge and he actually took double the amount of the objective he set out to do that. And he got through that. And he said, ever since then, I have never backed down from a challenge. One of his friends, when he actually died, he was 60 years old when he died, and the things he accomplished were amazing. But one of his friends said, it's a good thing he died in his sleep. If he'd been awake, death never could have taken him. You know, he was just that kind of guy. So how do we win the battle? I'm going to give you uh, an object lesson a little bit later, but I'm going to give you three basic principles today and challenge you on how you think about yourself. The first one is this. You can change the way you feel by changing the way you think. We often get it backwards. I feel a certain way, therefore I look at the world a certain way. I feel this, therefore reality should be this. I feel this, therefore I'm going to do this. And we are led around by our feelings, and feelings are a huge part of our society right now. Um, you know, j just to give you an example, um, you, you're always watching movies, romantic movies or movies, you know, and, and that, and, and someone's about to marry somebody, but, you know, there's a real challenge there. You know, the individual, maybe they're a drug dealer or something like that, and mom and dad will sit down with them and go, what is your heart telling you to do? What is your heart telling you to do? 
Can I just be honest with you? If I did everything my heart wanted to do, I'd be in jail. And so would most of you, right? Heart is capable of horrible things. We get it backwards. Emotions should reaction be a reaction to how we think about things. The feelings should follow the function. You would be surprised the amount of positive things you can bring about in your life by thinking about things the right way. And this is the kind of delayed gratification everybody knows about, but nobody wants to experience. You know, the, the idea of exercising so you're going to feel better. Well, if you've ever not exercised and then you start exercising, you feel like you're going to die. You would rather do anything than exercise, right? But what happens if you stick with it? You get stronger, right? Start feeling better. Your body starts reacting differently. I remember a number of years ago, I... I uh, went through a period of ministry where I wasn't, wasn't exercising. And, uh, you know, I finally determined to do it. So I started jogging again and doing a little weights. And I remember jogging and my legs all aching up and down and my knees feeling like they were going to give out and everything like that. And, you know, I suffered through that a little while. I was like, oh, you know, maybe I'm, it's too late. Maybe I stop doing this. But I stuck with it. And now I jog pain-free, Right? And I have a deeper capacity to breathe. I feel better. I stand up straighter. All these kind of things. Because I paid the price. Feeling has to follow function. You can change the way you feel by changing the way you think. Probably one of the greatest protagonists of this. A man who really um, had a um, horrible experience and then overcame it in order to have a rewarding life was a man named Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a, a person in a constant Nazi concentration camp. He was a doctor. Listen to some of the quotes from this individual. Okay? And you're thinking, well, I never overcome what I went through. This guy was in a concentration camp, saw much of his family, his friends. He saw horrible things and horrible evil. Listen to some of his quotes. When we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. That space is our power to choose our response. In response lies the growth and our freedom. Here was a man who had everything taken away from him. He had his ability to eat, his freedom to go anywhere, his ability to talk. All these things were taken away from him and he lived in a torturous, horrible, exact representation of what hell would be. Yet he learned to be content, happy, and have a good attitude in the middle of that. Everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And you may be, you know, as we're talking about this, you go, Scott, are we talking about mind over matter? I, I kind of don't like that, that in the sense that I want to add a greater truth to it. It's, it's not that we have this ability always to alter our feelings or alter our experiences and all that. But I'm a big fan of mind over matter in the sense when we understand how much God loves us. When we think about how God thinks of us. Because if we identified ourselves as God sees us and as God offers us and as God directs our life and as God works through us, the things about us are going to head in the great direction. Okay, So it's mind over matter, but I want you to think of God's mind over the matter. What does God think? Because as I absorb what God thinks, and then I think of myself that way, freedom begins. And this is what Viktor Frankl was talking about, that this in-between. We have opportunity when going through tribulation, all the kind of things. The one freedom that can't be taken from you is the freedom to choose your attitude. To choose your attitude. I've talked about this before, but um, a, a man I really look forward to, uh, up to is Ray Hendricks. Ray Hendricks was a, the principal of the Christian school here. And I remember talking to his wife years ago and saying, Ray's so, such a good attitude. Like, he's always got a can-do attitude. He was a principal of a Christian school. 
that was consistently under financial strain. It was consistently drama. I mean, you're dealing with people's kids. So you're dealing with parents and kids that aren't getting along. You're dealing with the ups and downs of that. You're dealing with people, you know, kids peeing their pants in the hall. And like, it's just drama all the time, right? And this guy had a great attitude. He was always smiling. He was always can do. He was always positive. The guy glowed. And I asked Doreen, I said, has he always been this way? She said, no, actually, he used to be a really angry person. He used to be a person you wouldn't want to be around. But he determined one day, he took a little program in Living Hope Church called uh, Consider It Joy. And he broke his day down into half an hour segments. And he identified the three or four half hour segments he hated the worst. The times and he tended to create the most amount of anger in his life. And he determined that those three or four blocks were going to become the highlight of his day. And he transformed how he thought, and he developed a can-do attitude. And he kept climbing that mountain. And before you knew it, nothing could snow the guy. Verse in uh, Proverbs, the wisest man in the world, he said, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. When we think <clears throat> of ourselves, and we think of how God loves us, and we're going to be talking about that in the coming weeks, when we think about that and we think about ourselves that way, our feelings will follow our function. Don't allow feelings to rule your life. A couple other verses are really, really great, and they tie into this next spot. Negative thoughts can't lead to a positive life. Negative thoughts can't lead to a positive life. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. This is the writer Paul in the New Testament. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not things of the earth. He was trying to get people to go, you know what, in your segment, you can look around and you see the world a certain way. Try to separate yourself from that and see the world the way God sees it. See, the way, see yourself the way God sees you. Set your mind on things above. And there have been people who have gone through horrific, horrible things in this life, who had their eyes up above and who prevailed and who went through them and are tremendous testimonies of faith. They didn't always win. That's not what I'm saying. But they did come through with their shoulders back, their head held high. Romans 12 and 2. And do not be conformed in this world by the transformed or the renewed... Oh, sorry, and... Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How you think makes a way for what you can do. That we may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Negative thoughts cannot lead to a positive life. There's a Stanford uh, professor called Arnold Zwick Zwicky. Okay? And this guy, he developed a theory what he called the frequency illusion. Okay? The frequency illusion, um, it's also called the confirmation bias. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Let's say you're on the market for a car, and you end up settling on a car, and let's say you get a Jetta, right? And you buy this Jetta, and you like your Jetta. And then, after driving it for a week or two, you recognize there's lots of Jettas out there. It's amazing. Who else has Jettas? Jettas are sweeping the nation. Every third person has a Jetta. We just start seeing Jettas everywhere, right? That's what's called confirmation bias. Right? If you begin your day with, today's going to be a bad day. Or if you begin your day with, nobody loves me. Or if you can begin your day with, I'm going to be overwhelmed by the circumstances. Or I can't just do my job one more day. Or I can't put up with my husband or wife or friend or girlfriend one more day. If we go into that attitude, what happens is confirmation bias kicks in. And the negativity of how we think makes it a self-fulfilling prophecy. It ends up being that way. People who get up with a negative frame of mind, more often than not, will have a negative day. People who wake up or enter things with a defeatist mindset, more than often end up feeling and being defeated. You cannot have a positive life with negative thoughts. Negative thoughts do not lead to to a positive life. So we look into life and say, what should we think on? What should we do? 
Philippians 4 and 8 says, the passion, this is the Passion Translation, which is a new one. I kind of like it. Um, so keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising Him always. Man, this is one you should get tattooed on you, right? Isn't, it? Isn't that a great way of looking at the world? You know, some people are going to walk out here and they're going to see, oh, it's February and everything's dirty and, you know, and it's cold and, you know, the sun's behind the cloud and everything. And some people are going to walk out and go, February, home stretch. We're almost by winter, but I love winter. I love winter sports. I love to jump in the snow and make snow angels. I like to run around the snow. I have so many fond memories of when I was a kid in the snow and Christmas and everything like that. But it's soon going to be gone, and then spring's going to happen. Flowers are going to come out. War days are going to get warmer. It's going to be wonderful. April showers are going to bring all these beautiful plants, and God created this world. And I can't wait to get home just to talk to my spouse. And yeah, it's cold outside, but I live in a warm, propane heated house, so I can just snuggle up by the heater and read a book. Or, you know, throw a blanket over, or I can watch TV, or I can do some. I have all these freedoms. And thank the Lord I live in this free country where I can do all this stuff. You know, some people look at it that way. Third one. It is impossible to worship and worry at the same time. As we fix our mind on things above, our way of thinking becomes transformed. And worrying recedes. I don't know about you, but I'm a worrier. I, I have a degree in worrying. <laughs> I worry about stuff that couldn't possibly come true. I worry about stuff that, that may be a complete falsehood. You know, I, I have the capacity to go, everybody feels this way about me, or everybody feels that way about this, or nobody will ever do this. You know, I'm a worrier, and a lot of you are too. But you can't worship and worry at the same time. When you are enamored with a powerful God, it's hard to be defeated. Because in God, in the way we see Him, in the way we live with Him and interact with Him, it can transform us. So the decision today, are you going to be grateful? Are you going to be grumbling? Are you going to pray? Are you going to pout? Are you going to encourage? Or are you going to complain? You cannot be accidentally negative while you're being intentionally positive. So, what we're praying for today is a new mind. And so I have an, a little lesson for you. And this is a little take home. Two things actually. You'll see these cards in the table. This is a great series to invite people to church to. Okay? Do you know somebody... And don't steal people from other churches. That's a really nasty thing to do. Okay, don't do that. Because you stress out that pastor and then they get negative thoughts and then they, it's not good. Okay? <laughs> Look for people who don't have a church background. These are people in the city who are Kawartha Community Church honorary members. They don't know they are, but they are. Right? If there's anybody in this city that doesn't have a church home and is looking for God, let's be those people. And so invite them with a card. You know, say, hey, we've got this new series. thought you might enjoy it. I did with someone today. And then on the tables are playing cards. We're kind of tying this in with the wolf positive, all that kind of stuff. It's just part of the art. But uh, there's four different types of cards, if you're uh, familiar with your card playing. I know some of you are poker savants. Um, so I don't want you to play poker at your tables, okay? But what I do want you to do is take a card home. All right. Maybe the card you need to take home is the something of hearts. Because maybe your heart right now is a major area of concern. Maybe you have a hard heart. Maybe you have a broken heart. Maybe you've got a, a, a heart that is full of hate. And I want you to take this card home. And I want you to put it somewhere where you're going to see it all the time. And every time you look at this, I want you to think, God, can give me a new heart. And pray that little prayer. God, give me a new heart. Okay? Some of you may need to take that home. Some of you may need to take 
a speed home. Speeds. Speeds are symbolic of things that you've buried that have never been dealt with. And you need to dig them up and deal with them. Okay? Maybe it's, it's a past wound that's happened to you and you've tried to bury it and it's been so intense that it starts speaking to you and it says, okay, if you're not going to deal with me, at least make me feel better. And you've entered into all kinds of self-destructive behavior because you feel dead. And you feel like this thing is going to own you. And its skeletal hands are hanging on to your ankle from the grave. That's a lovely analogy. I've been watching too many zombie movies. Um, and maybe this week is going to be the week I'm going to dig that out. I'm going to face it. I'm going to, in God's name, tell it, it's done, it's dead, go away. And I'm going to deal with it, and then I'm going to bury it so deep that it will not have a hold over me anymore. Maybe the spades is your card this week. Maybe it's diamonds. Maybe it's diamonds. Maybe your card that you need to take home, and if you need to take all four cards home, I'm really going to pray for you this week. But <laughs> diamonds, maybe you feel worthless. Maybe the thing that holds you back in life is you are down on yourself all the time. I always, always tell people, like, I don't need any more critics because I'm a, my own worst critic, right? You ever, you ever sense that? And sometimes people help us with the criticism. I'm not down playing that, but it tends to be we're harder on ourselves than other people are. And we tend to beat ourselves up. And I know some people are born self-confident and you know, it'd be nice to see them taken down a peg or two, but <laughs> most of us actually are pretty hard on ourselves. And uh, God says that's a lie. He wants to challenge evil behavior in us. That's a good thing. But we are not worthless. We are not worthless. When God sees you, He sees someone who could potentially be or is His child. And you are the apple of His eye. God is so amazing and so full of love that He could love each one of us as if we're the only person on the world. And you sit and you think, I'm worthless. I want you to know you're not worthless. God, the God of the universe, the creator of everything, the one that gives us a new breath, every minute or every few seconds. He loves you. And you are not worthless. And you are precious in His sight. And so this week, when you, you start to self-talk, and you start to do those negative thoughts on yourself, I want you to pull out your diamond and go, eh! No. God loves me. And I know i got changes to do, i got things to improve, i got things i got to face, but I'm worth it. Right? Maybe it's a diamond. <laughs> Or maybe it's a club. This one is for the challenges we have in life that rear our, their ugly heads at us, that distract us. Okay? And, and maybe it's something, some sort of self-destructive behavior, or maybe it's, it's something that pulls you away, and whenever you feel bad, you kind of run to this thing, but you end up feeling lousier after you do it, or are part of it, than you did to go on it. Well, this week, we're going to call a club. And this club, we're going to take it out when that thing rears its head and we're going to whack a mole it hard. The club is our bat. We're and when those things, those things that, that eat away at us and, and distract us and keep us from living our life properly, maybe it's gossip, maybe it's, it's complaining, maybe it's, you know, taking too much medication or over drinking or gambling or shopping or something like that, whatever it is. Whack it. And go, you will not rule me this week. I am a child of God. And I will find victory. Alright? So, I, I, you know, I might be shy about it, but I've covered all four. And trust me, your, people at your table probably don't know which one you know, or why. But I want you to take a card home this week. Okay? Find a card and take one. You may say, well, three actually qualify for me. Take one. Okay? <laughs> right? Baby steps, okay? Baby steps. But we want to change the way we think. So I want you to change the way you think about that one thing this week. And to seize this truth. 
Okay? And then next week, we'll continue on. I'm uh, going to ask the basket people to come forward, and they're going to have baskets. Um, if you're not on our email list, Selena's great. She sends out these wonderful emails letting us know everything that's going on each week and that. So if you want to sign up for that, you can get notifications. If you have a cell number and you want text notifications, we do that as well. And so let us know that. Um, there's also offering envelopes in there. Thank you. That's a way of worshiping too. Appreciate it helping us do what we do here today. But the most important thing that we want to happen in your life today is that you have been given a light in a dark place. So that's our prayer for you today. While we do that, it's a wonderful music video from a, a band called from King, King and Country. One of my favorite bands. And this might be you today, so enjoy it while the baskets are going around and uh, as you're filling things in. Yes, Thank you. As God sees us. And for us to be able to overcome the things that we do to hold ourselves back. And, and the ultimate thing that I believe is a path to that is for us to choose God and choose His way of what's well, a gift, really. God offers us through His Son a new life, and 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 it's a life that 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 takes what is broken and dead and 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 hopeless and fills it full of hope. And millions and millions of people in history have heard that message of God's hope. And they have given their lives to Jesus Christ. They've given their lives to God. And that has been the turning point of their lives. It was for me, and it was for many of you. And so today as we consider this, maybe today's the day where you will say in your heart, God, I'm beginning to understand it. Now that I understand it, I want it. And you will open up your hearts and you will go, Jesus, my life, it's yours. Take the broken pieces and help me transform myself through the way you look at me, you empower me, you save me, you... We all need it. Life without God is a life that may represent lots of things, but it's not the best you you can be. You need help. You need people around you. You need a family. You need a tribe. And you need God. We all do. The Augustine, who was a, a, a monk over 1,800 years ago, wrote that every human being has this God-shaped hole in their hearts that can only be filled with Him. And maybe you've been walking around and you go, there's this huge gap in me. Well, it's meant to be filled. It's an appetite that is meant to be identified and fed. And it is how you were made. We are made to walk in unison with our Creator. Him in our hearts, our hand in His, to victory in life, no matter what life throws at us. And maybe today's the day you do that. So I've asked Neil, he's going to close in a worship song. And if that's you here today, I want you to say, God, I'm in. God, I'm in. I, I, I look, I, I'd like this new life to get, that for you to give me. I want you to save me, to fill this hole. And then after the service, talk to me or talk to one of our staff and say, I just want to let you know today I made that choice. And I'll let you know what I'm going to do so you're not freaked out about it. I'm going to give you a Bible. Okay. I'm going to talk to about where you can read it. I'm going to talk about some next steps. You're not signing up to a cult. <laughs> okay, it, it really is. It's just stuff to help you. And, and we'll invite you to come back next week to hear more of the story. Because that's what we do each week. We gather to talk and to learn about who God is and what it means to serve Him. And then we also come to love on each other. We we'll come because everyone here needs a family. And the people around you can be your brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's an amazing thing. It really is. Why don't you stand and close in a song. Alright? That's your homework. Take that home. Now you may notice when you came in today there's a mirror 
standing there. And what I want you to do over the next few weeks is you come in, look in that mirror, and tell yourself, what do I see there? If you see defeat, and you see unworthiness, and you see pain, in these next few weeks, let's do what we need to do to make ourselves right. All right? Let's give ourselves a new heart. And uh, that's all i got to say about that. Thank you for being with us. Next week, like I said, if you pick up a card and invite somebody out, we got room to grow. So uh, we're glad you could be with us. All right? God bless you as you go. We'll see you next week.